Well, I want to say uh, good morning. Uh, welcome back to many of you. It's good to, to see you. Uh, welcome to those of you who are uh, in the youth room uh, in our mass service today. We're just grateful for an opportunity to gather together as the Church of Jesus Christ. Our mission here is to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. And so what we want to do week after week after week is to challenge you to surrender more of your heart and more of your life to Jesus. Like over time, it's our heart and our prayer that you would look less and less like you and more and more like him. And that would happen with us corporately as a church that we go out into our community, into our culture, and we spread the love of Jesus Christ uh, with us wherever it is that we might go. And so just on the front end, um, I'm praying that God would do something profound in your heart this morning that you wouldn't be the same uh, when you leave here as you are now. So I don't know if you guys saw this, uh, but recently uh, there was a big deal going on, on with GameStop. I don't know if you saw this, uh, but it's pretty exciting news and especially exciting for me because I got an early tip. Right? I, someone early on, when it was just now starting to be talked about on the Reddit thread, it was Wall Street Vets, like people were like, hey, you need to invest in this stock, everyone's going to do it, it's going to be this great big thing, and so got an early hint early on, and so let me just tell you what this stock did, y'all. Um, a lot of people start piling in, the price starts going up. Some people, I, I didn't get there, right? Some people recognize gains of 120 to 130 times what they invested. So I invested to, uh, not quite to the extent, there was a, a young man by the name of Arzel Rodriguez who sold what was initially a $28,000 investment for $3.8 million dollars, right? I mean, this is pretty profound. Like, I hope some of you aren't out there and you're sad because you missed out on it. I hope maybe you had a chance to partake. I am not a day trader. I'm not a particularly good investor, uh, but I did invest uh, over the last quarter. Uh, I've been investing in my, my savings account, and uh, I recognize a, a quarterly rate of return of 37 cents on uh, all the money I had in savings, and I do want you to know, uh, reading about the GameStop stuff, I, I just want to say to you on the front end, um, what you invest in really, really matters. Where and what you invest in uh, can have a profound impact on what you're ultimately going to realize later on. Now, uh, I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. I'm going to argue for you this morning that the single greatest investment you will ever make in your life, the greatest investment you'll make in yourself, in your family, uh, in your, your community, uh, the single greatest investment you will ever make is the investment in knowing Christ Jesus, your Lord. As a matter of fact, if you don't do that, nothing else will matter. If you don't make that one investment, everything else you're going to uh, pursue, everything else you're going to pour your life into, your money, your time, your energy, all of that is ultimately going to come to nothing. There's a story in Acts chapter 9 uh, about a man by the name of Saul. Uh, we, saw, we heard a little bit of this story last week. Uh, his name did change to Paul. But he told about his story, about the life that he had lived uh, up to uh, the point in Acts chapter 9. Uh, he was a young man who was born into Judaism. He had this nice, um, noble birth, if you will, tribe of Benjamin. He was born into the nation of Israel, uh, but he didn't stop there. He invested heavily in Judaism. And so he was raised up, trained up in it, um, and he really, he pursued it full on. Uh, the Apostle Paul likely could have quoted the first five books of the Old Testament. It says that he excelled in Judaism beyond all of his peers. He was trained under a man named Gamaliel, who was one of the most respected scholars of his day. And so this is like, Paul is like, Ivy League in Judaism. He was a Pharisee, which meant he was a teacher of the law. Like people would come to him and be like, how do I live it? Paul, tell me how to do it. You know, not only that, he actually lived it out really well in his life. But this man who's given his life to pursuing God through Judaism, in Acts chapter 9, I want you to hear what happened in his life. Life. He's so zealous for the Jewish faith that he's actually persecuting um, what he's going to call the way. These are those early followers of Jesus Christ who weren't, according to Paul's thinking, living as they should have. And so it says this in Acts chapter 9, verse 1. It says, Now Saul, that was his name at the time, he, be, he was still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and he asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, these are believers, uh, both men and women, he might bring them bound 
to Jerusalem. So he's not going to bind them for fun's sake, right? This isn't a game. He wants to throw them in prison, and he's threatening to kill them, all right? This is Paul and his zeal. As he was traveling in verse 3, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. We're not told what this light was like. Lightning was a stroke. We don't know. But it profoundly shook the Apostle Paul. He'd invested his whole life in Judaism. And there's this moment that I pray that none of us ever has to have. He sees the bright light. He hears a voice. Verse 4, it says, He fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? And then these words, just overwhelming when you think about all that he invested his life in. Saul says, who are you, Lord? You ever think about that? A man that invested his whole life in the knowing God. The, the guy that everyone would have come to with their questions about who God was and how they should live. He knew the, the law. He could quote the Old Testament. He finds at this point himself on his knees. He's recognized that whatever it is that's speaking to him in this moment, the voice that he's hearing, the thing that knocked him on his knees, he knows this is God. And even more so, he recognizes that he doesn't know this God. Who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. Get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. It was this moment in Paul's life that changed everything for him. It was this moment that would lead him to conclude, as we saw last week in first, uh, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7. He says, but whatever things were gained to me, and whatever things people would have looked at me and said, that guy, he knows God. If anybody knows God, he does. All the training, all the study, whatever things were gained to me, I have now counted as loss for the sake of knowing Christ Jesus. Like, think about this. His whole life to this point. Invested in knowing Jesus and knowing God, knowing who he was, but somehow he missed it. Wouldn't it be a shame if the same was true for us? That all the understandings about who God was that we've brought since childhood, this is what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. And for many of us, it's like raised in church. I was there, you know, when I was a, an infant. Mom and dad had me there every Sunday. I, I got the, the pen in Sunday school for attendance. I'd done all the things, but wouldn't it be a shame? If we, as modern-day believers, had an experience a little bit like Paul, where we find ourselves having invested our life in something but not actually knowing Jesus Christ. Today, I want to speak to you about what it means to know Jesus. I want to talk to you about the greatest investment you will ever make. As a matter of fact, I want to tell you that the single greatest investment you'll ever make in your life is the investment in knowing Christ Jesus, the Lord, the time and the energy and the effort that you put into that will change everything for you. More than if you'd invested in GameStop, more than if you'd bought Amazon 20 years ago, like more than any of that. This will profoundly change your life. So the apostle Paul here, he's talked about his life in Judaism. He counts as this loss, like, man, that I might gain Christ. But he goes on in, in verse 8, and he's going to tell us even more. He's like, it's not just my religious efforts that I count as loss. He goes on in verse 8 and he says, more than that. Beyond my efforts to know God, memorize scripture, be righteous according to the law. More than that, I count all things as loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, the Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Now, when we uh, hear Paul say this, uh, our, our English understanding, if you will, uh, we tend to think, okay, that means there is a deficit in the other things, and there's a gain in Christ. When and really, uh, what Paul is doing here is he's not necessarily saying everything in life means that you, it, it's lost. Like you have a family, that's not lost, right? Or you have a, a job, you go to work, you care for people, that's not all lost. What he's doing is he's making a statement of comparison here. What he's saying is Christ is so much greater that he makes everything else look like a loss in comparison. Like com compared to the worth of knowing Jesus Christ, any other thing that you're going to invest your life in pales in comparison. So I count everything as loss in light of the worth, in light of the value of coming to know Jesus Christ, my Lord, even more. And he, so he, he points out, 
for whom I've suffered the loss of all things. Because of what Paul came to understand there on the road to Damascus that day, he left his life in Judaism. He left his position as a Pharisee. One of the teachers who could tell tell the synagogue, hey, give me some letters, I'm going to go arrest people. Paul walked away from all of that. And instead, he gave his whole life to following after Jesus Christ. Can I ask you this? What is your version of success in this life? What would it look like for you? If you were to write out your life plan and you could just kind of arrange your life according to the way that you would want things to go, um, what would that look like? So for, for many of us, it's, hey, I want to, you know, grow up. You want to get your high school diploma. You want to maybe go to college or a trade school, get a job, uh, get married one day, have a family, you know, live a good, successful life, have plenty of money for retirement. Maybe you want to travel. Maybe you want to be successful in business. I don't know what it looks like for you, but the Apostle Paul would say, And I would tell you as your pastor, matter of fact, if this is the last sermon I ever got to preach to you, above all else, I would want you to know that above your vision for life, above the things you're going to strive for, above your hopes and your dreams, the greatest investment you will ever make in your life, the greatest pursuit of your life is in knowing Christ Jesus the Lord. It's above every other thing. Can I tell you that that's true not just for you, that's true for your marriage. Like the greatest possible thing for your marriage isn't like the, the retreat. If you want to go on the retreat, do it right. It's not date night every week. It's not all of these things that we would point to that say, hey, this will make a great marriage. The greatest investment you'll ever make in your marriage is that you might know Christ Jesus the Lord. Can I say this is true for your kids too? And I know you want them to be like academic all-stars and make, you know, professional baseball players or whatever it is that you would want for your kid. Listen, the single greatest thing you could ever give to them, the single greatest investment you will ever make in their lives, far and above ball practice or academic success or lots and lots of money and inheritance, is that they might know Christ Jesus the Lord. Paul says everything else is like loss in comparison. Everything else is like a 37 cent rate of interest return on your money compared to the 150 fold uh, return you could have had in GameStop. It's like there's no comparison. The question is, is why would we continue to leave our money in savings if we knew there was an investment where we couldn't lose? Why would we continue to invest our money anywhere else if we knew there was a place where we could put it, where we would experience an extraordinary return, the greatest possible return? Why would we leave it on the sidelines? Why would we put it anywhere else? And yet, in our lives, we often do, don't we? We get distracted along the way. We find ourselves asking the question, oh, how did I forget to spend time in the Word today? And I just get so busy, I didn't have time to, to, to spend in prayer or pursuing the Lord. Or I, I'm not, I, I don't have time for church this week or to pursue community with other believers. I think oftentimes our lives tell a story that we believe something other than what Paul believed. That we believe there are things that are of greater gain for us. So I want to remind you the greatest possible investment you'll ever make is the time that you spend. The greatest gift you'll ever give is the time that you spend pursuing Christ Jesus the Lord. So the question would come then, what do we get, right? I mean, what is the return on our investment? If we'll say you know, you no know to some of our hobbies, if we'll say no to pursuing greater wealth. I mean, hobbies are fun, right? Traveling the world, awesome. Like, wealth, it's a good time, right? So if we're going to say, man, I see those things as lost compared to knowing Christ Jesus the Lord, what are the things that we gain as a result of knowing Christ Jesus? What do we... What do we get? What's our return on our investment? Paul would say, hey, I'm, I'm glad that you asked. Look here in verse 8. He says, more than that, I count all things to be lost in light of the surpassing value, like big returns here, of knowing Christ Jesus the Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. In Christ, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, But that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Can I tell you uh, that you are relating to God on the basis of one of two things, right? Um, You are relating to God on the basis of your own righteousness. 
That means uh, the basis of how well you've lived your life. Uh, have you been good or have you been bad? Were you uh, righteous or were you sinful? And as you look at your life, you may draw varying conclusions about how well you've lived before God. I hope if you're here, you're willing to acknowledge that you've blown it a few times. Your spouse wishes you would acknowledge that you've blown it a few times, right? I mean, if you've been around very long, you've sinned. You've, you've messed up. And one day you're going to stand before God, and you're going to stand before God on the basis of your own righteousness or on the basis of Christ's righteousness. Now, the Scriptures would tell us that every one of us, whether we want to admit it or not, have sinned, and we fall short of the glory of God. We just have. We weren't good enough. You think about God who is perfectly holy and righteous and just. He can't have fellowship with sinful men, right? Like righteousness and sin. He he actually compares it like what fellowship does light have with darkness? Like they don't mix. So you and I, because of our sin, we find ourselves separated from God. And that's not just today. That's going to span into eternity. When we breathe our last breath here on earth, if we haven't been reconciled to God in some way, we're going to spend eternity in a place called hell. So Paul, he's like, you want to know? I know in Christ is so profound. Is that I found a new righteousness there. It's not a righteousness based upon his good works. Matter of fact, Jesus said, hey, if you, if you want to know what righteousness is, you need to be perfect as I am perfect. Your righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And Paul would be like, hey, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I was flawless with regard to legalistic righteousness under the law, but it wasn't good enough. If you want to know the worth of knowing Christ Jesus the Lord, why it's so valuable and important is that I found a new kind of righteousness, not on the basis of my works, but instead on the basis of the work of Jesus Christ who came and lived a sinless life here on this earth and then he went to the cross to die the debt that you and I deserve for our sin. Jesus paid the debt that you and I owed. That when we place our faith and trust in Jesus, God takes our sin and he placed it on his son. He took the righteousness of Jesus and he credits that to us. And there on the cross, Jesus suffered and he bled and he died for you. And he credited to us that perfect righteousness. Paul's like, you want to know why I count everything else as loss in light of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus the Lord? He's like, because I was doomed to an eternity in hell, to the rest of his life enslaved to sin and destruction. He was going to spend eternity in hell, but he found a righteousness in Christ whereby he was justified, not by his own works, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So the first benefit of knowing Christ Jesus the Lord is justification. This is what it means to have like right standing with God. Here, to kind of clarify what that question means, um, if you stood before God and he asked you, hey, why should I let you into heaven? The answer that you would give him is likely what you're trusting in for justification. And so if you're like, well, you know, I'm, I was a I'm, I'm a little four county boy. I got in some trouble when I was a kid, but whatever. I, I was pretty good after that. That is what you're trusting in. That would say that you think you are justified by your own righteousness. Or maybe you're like, hey, God, I went to church a lot, gave a lot of money, helped a lot of people. That would mean you're trusting in your giving or your attendance or your belief or whatever it might be in order to justify yourself before God. But Paul's like, listen, I found something better. I found the one thing which is sufficient for justification. And that is faith in Jesus Christ. So to be really clear, the only way you can be reconciled to God is by coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Trusting in Him alone to justify you. His work to justify you before God. So this is like benefit for all of our life, right? Uh, Apart from Christ, we're dead in trespasses and sin. We're enslaved to sin. We can do no other apart from Him. Our eternity, it's sealed. We're going to go to a place called hell, and you will suffer there for eternity. So Paul's like, come on, right? Like, this is, this is the benefits of the gospel of Jesus. Like, I found that knowing Jesus is better than all the stuff. Wouldn't it be a tragedy to live a life where you're wealthy and famous and known and influential and powerful for just a few years and then spend the rest of your eternity in hell? That's the argument Jesus makes. Like, what is a problem, man? 
to gain the world and forfeit his soul. And so Paul's like, man, I found the thing that's worth giving up every other thing for. It makes everything else look like, my, look like loss by comparison. That's knowing Christ Jesus, the Lord. I found the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So number one is justification. I, I'm going to just warn you on the front end. I'm giving you three big nerdy biblical words to hang on to. All right. The first is justification. The second is sanctification. And this is the process where in this life, like we don't just like suffer through uh, miserable, addicted lives as, and like just try to hang on until one day we die and then we get better. Like, oh, now I get to be in heaven with God. No, sanctification means that as a result of knowing Christ Jesus, the Lord, um, he's going to begin to transform your heart right now. Last week, Paul said this in chapter 3. He talked about the true circumcision versus the false circumcision. He's like, man, there are people out there that think because something happened to their flesh that somehow they're, they're like good, like they've been, they're good before God. And he's like, listen, that's false. That's a lie. He's like, you want to know what true circumcision is? It's where your heart has been transformed as you come to know Jesus Christ. Like you're a new creation in him. You have a new set of desires. When I was in ninth grade, I was a total hellion. Uh, just to kind of put it on the table, I had plans with several of my buddies. We were going to go uh, get drunk. We had an ice chest smuggled in. All the things like this is going to happen um, on the following weekend. Like I, there were lots of bad things that I was planning to do then. And that's what I wanted. It's what my heart wanted. And on a Tuesday night, God did something in me. And it was totally God because the guys that were up there talking hadn't even really talked yet. And I'm like sitting there like, man, I, I got to get things right with God. Like, this is profound in me. Like, I've, my eyes have begun to see. Like, I've come to trust in Jesus. And I'm like, I wish he'd quit preaching so I could go down for the invitation because I thought that's what I needed to do. Like, God had done something in me. And I remember waking up the next morning, and the desires to do the things that I'd already planned out to do that weekend, they had begun to change. And I'm like, I don't want to do the things anymore. And I don't even know why. Like, what's happening to me? I thought I was sick or something. Like, God doesn't just, it's not about outward junk for us. It's not about living a life where we have to fake that we love everybody and we want to be kind all the time. It's like, hey, I'm great. Life's fantastic. It's not what it's about. Jesus, like, true circumcision. You want to know the true benefit of knowing Christ Jesus the Lord? It's that your heart begins to desire different things, that you don't have to make war for the rest of your life against that addiction that's got a hold of you and won't let go, but that you can be set free. Now, I, I do need to tell you that while I didn't desire to go get drunk with my friends anymore that weekend, man, there were some things along the way that had their grip on me that they didn't go away quite as quickly. Like sanctification is this process of being conformed to the image of Christ that takes our entire life. Like it won't be finished until the day that I die. But more and more, what ought to be true of us is that we're desiring the things that Christ desires. We're forsaking sin and following after Jesus Christ. Here's what Paul says. He says that I may know him, in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That means, listen, Jesus died on the cross, he spent three days in the grave, and he rose, right? He rose from the dead, like, that's power right there. If someone is raised from the dead, like, that's a legitimate miracle. If I see someone in the grave for three days, like, they raised, that's profound. Like, this is truly miraculous. And Paul's like, man, I want to see it in my life, too. That that old man, Saul, the one who persecuted Christians and trusted in his own righteousness, that he might die and there might be a new man now living. I want to know the power of the resurrection. He's like, I want to see it lived out in my life. I don't want to live a mediocre, a southeast Oklahoma, like pretty good old boy or girl life. I want to see the power of God at work in me and the power of God at work through me. You want to know why it's so worth it to know Jesus is because there's something far more for you than just salvation. One day when you die, there's sanctification. You can live as Christ. You can make a difference today because of the work of the Spirit through you. You want to know why everything else is lost? There is a brand new victorious Christian life ahead of you. As you begin to invest in knowing Christ Jesus, the Lord, your heart, begins to be transformed so much so that look what Paul says here. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection. I may know him in the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to death. Can I just tell you, men whose hearts haven't been transformed, 
who haven't come to know Christ Jesus, you, you don't look forward to suffering. Like there's no joy in that. Just suffering. It breaks our hearts, right? But when we begin to be sanctified, when God begins to transform us, we can find joy in the midst of suffering in the same way that Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, right? That it would be our joy to suffer on behalf of other people. So there's, there's two things that can make suffering worthwhile for us. One, in the midst of suffering, we come to know Jesus Christ even more. The times where I've come to know God most clearly, the times where I've experienced Him like most closely, are those moments in my life where I'm flat on my face and I'm done. I have nowhere else to turn. There's nowhere else to hope. And it's been in those moments that I've sensed who God really is, His grace, His mercy, His patience, His gentleness, as at no other time in my life. And Paul's like, man, if suffering brings more of knowing Christ, I'm in. I'm in. The second reason we might suffer is on behalf of our brothers and sisters. You may never tell so powerful a testimony as the testimony that you preach in the midst of your suffering. You know what suffering will do if you don't know Jesus? It makes you bitter. It makes you angry. It leads to hopelessness, but in Christ Jesus, we can consider it joy when we face trials of many kinds, the testing of our faith, because we know that that's bringing perseverance in us. It's maturing us as we learn to trust Jesus Christ more. God might use your misery, your suffering, your trials, that someone else might know him. So Paul's like, man, you want to know the worth of knowing Jesus? And it's profound justification before God. It's having your heart transformed before Him. And the third thing is glorification. And this is what happens to us finally. Like when we leave this life and we're joined together in heaven with God. You know this old body that hurts and struggles? You know those fleshly desires that you've battled against that man, they're still there whether you like it or not? There will be a day where there's no more suffering no more shame, no more struggle, no more sin, like no more weakness of the flesh, but you'll have a perfect body once again. Right now, we know God kind of dimly, the scriptures will say, but there will be a day where we see him face to face. And I promise you that one day when you're in heaven, like if we could just interview you in that moment, like with God, if you could come back and talk to yourself now, or just share with your kids right now, or your, your spouse, or your friends, like what you would say is, listen, everything in life is loss compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus the Lord. Most of us know these sorts of things intellectually, like we believe, like, oh yes, that's right, seeking Jesus is the best thing, but you know what inevitably happens to us? Like we drift from what we know to be true and we pursue other things and we miss out on the joy that could be ours from knowing Jesus Christ more. Dads, I want to say this to you. And I know I hear dads talk about their kids and they're proud of them, the things that they want for them. They talk about their marriage, how much they love their wives. I want to say this one more time to you. There is no greater gift you will ever give to your spouse or to your children, no greater mark you will ever leave on this world, no greater gift you will give than the time that you spend getting to know Christ Jesus the Lord and allowing him to transform you and to transform your heart, conforming you to the image of Christ. The greatest possible thing you could ever do, far beyond finding a cure for coronavirus or cancer, far beyond making a bunch of money, far beyond making sure your kid is successful in whatever they, they pursue, teaching them to know Christ Jesus the Lord, setting that example. Same for you moms. It's true for us as a church. There's no greater gain in all of life than knowing Christ Jesus the Lord. I want to give you just uh, four quick things to consider um, as we seek to know Christ as the people of God. Um, the first is just how do we do that? Um, 
Uh, around here, we just call it devoting daily. That means that every single day you get up and you're going to spend time in the Word, in prayer, seeking God's Spirit. And, and when we say devote daily, what I'm not talking about is the kind of walking with Christ where you get up and for 15 minutes you're like, okay, I'm with God. And then we like close the lid like we're done. And then on Wednesday night we might come and we seek God again. And then on Sunday morning we do it again. Listen, that's not it at all. When we talk about devoting daily, that means every single day you get up, you deny yourself, and you take up your cross. And you're like, God, I'm going to follow you. God, the greatest gain in all of life is knowing Christ Jesus the Lord. Today I want to know you. I want to walk with you through my meeting I've got to have at work, through the mundane task I've got to accomplish, take my kids to practice. God, I want to walk with you. I want to know you in the midst of that. We call it devoting daily, that it would be an ongoing, normal part of your life to seek after God. But you don't do life on your own, but you know that Jesus Christ is with you in every single moment. Number two, I would encourage you to regularly examine your priorities. Everything in this life is going to push you away from knowing Jesus. When I was a kid, I went on a mission trip to Mexico when I was pretty young. And uh, I remember very distinctly, we went into a market. And as you walk down the street, everybody's trying to sell you something, you know, and it's kind of overwhelming. I'm like a five foot tall little boy. And they're like, hey, have a beaded bracelet or a, you need a sombrero. And I'm just like almost overwhelmed by all the things people are telling me that I need. I got to where I kind of enjoyed that, by the way. It was a good time after a while. At first, it was really overwhelming. But here's the thing. Our world is kind of like that for you. And everywhere you go, everything you do, media, music, every bit of it, they're trying to sell you something. And it's a cheap substitute for knowing Christ Jesus the Lord. They're like, hey, give your life to this hobby. It's going to make you happy. Paul's like, it's lost compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus the Lord. Hey, get this car, get the money, get the house, have the success, or pursue the fame. Loss in light of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus the Lord. And so what we do is we regularly evaluate our priorities. Where am I investing my time and my energy and my money? Is it in seeking Christ? Is it to know Him? Or have I found that I, I haven't been seeking God at all? I've been pursuing lots of things in life except God. And it, listen, it happens in, in my life. There's this consistent drift, and it's never toward Christ. It's always the way. So uh, regularly examine your priorities. Number three, you should expect resistance. And don't think for a second that when you endeavor, you're like, man, I'm going to pursue Jesus. I'm going to get up and I'm going to spend time in the Word. There's lots of things you can pursue in your life. Nothing will be so hard for you as seeking after Jesus Christ because we have an enemy. Jesus is like, hey, I came that you might have life and have it to the fullest. But he warns us in the same sentence. There's an enemy out there that's committed to stealing and killing and destroying. Like there's an enemy that's going to war against you. You should expect resistance. You should know that if you're going to say, I'm going to read through the Word, you should know that it's going to be ten times harder to get up in the morning, that there will be more distractions in the evening. Things will press back against you. Just get ready for it. Be like, God, I need your grace. Like, I need the power of your Spirit right here. This needs to be manifested that I might seek you and know you. So devote daily. Regularly examine your priorities. Expect resistance. And number four, and anticipate reward. You won't see it right now. It's like planting a seed in the garden. By the way, if you haven't got your gardens tilled up, it's about that time, right? It's like planting a seed in a, a, a garden. You know that you're not going to see the benefit tomorrow or even next week or next month. It's going to take a while. But as you tend that garden, you sow these good things in your life, you pursue knowing Christ Jesus the Lord, you can look forward to one day eating a big old plate full of fried squash, right? You know that there are rewards coming and it ought to drive you to seek Him even more. What you should understand is that there is no greater investment you will ever make in your entire life than in knowing Christ Jesus, the Lord. Would you bow with me? With heads bowed and eyes closed today, I don't do this very often. I just felt kind of compelled to do so this morning. If you're here and you feel a little bit like the Apostle Paul, who had given his whole life to something, only to re realize that he missed out on the one thing that truly mattered. If you're here today, there's never been a time where you truly came to know Jesus Christ, but today you recognize that, hey, you've been pursuing all the wrong things, and today is the day that your heart has been filled with faith, that you want to begin pursuing Jesus Christ. Is that, if that's you, 
Would you be bold, so bold this morning as to just lift your hand? I'm going to pray for you. I'm not going to call you down front. Anybody out there that say, hey, that's me, Jason, would you just pray for me? Today's the day that I've trusted in Jesus Christ. Thank you. Anybody else? Lift your hand. Thank you. If that's you today, and this is the first time you're trusting in Jesus Christ, um, can I just encourage you, don't leave here without letting somebody know. I'm going to be here uh, after this service is over. There are people sitting around you that would love to teach you and walk with you through what it means to follow after Jesus Christ. Um, the rest of you, if you're here today and you think about your priorities, how you've been investing your time, your energy, your money, and it's been something other than knowing Christ Jesus the Lord. As a matter of fact, knowing Christ Jesus the Lord has been kind of at the bottom of the list. What I would encourage you to do today in response to the Word of God, in response to the worth of knowing Christ Jesus the Lord, is that as you go down your list, you would just begin to repent. God, I put my kids above knowing you. There's nothing wrong with kids. They're good things. But above all else, I need to seek knowing Christ Jesus the Lord. And so what you do is you walk down your list and be like, God, I need to confess this. And I want to repent. I want to seek you first. I want to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and trust that all these other things are going to be handled. When I get my priorities in order, everything else falls into place. So during this time of invitation, this time of response, I just encourage you to do business with God, that you're repenting over the things that need to be repented of. And maybe you're saying, God, would you help me to seek you, asking for strength, asking for God to give you the power to overcome the things that's broken in your life. So right now I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to have time of response. And uh, you just do business with God.